All right, we are <laughs> live on Friday Night Fever. Oh my god! Oh, that just, it just seems it's going to be even a better show when where there's a rocky road. I feel like that's just a sign. So yeah, Friday Night Feels, people. <laughs> Okay, it has been uh, to get. I'm just <laughs> sweet Jesus, take the wheel. Okay, so I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, it's been a while. I had some complications on my end with technology, and they seem to seep into tonight. So <laughs> I am licensed mental health counselor and certified life coach, Patrick Manette, and this is Friday Night Feels, which is a show that focuses on a variety of wellness-related issues, such as mental health, addiction, health concerns, stress management, relationships, mindfulness, and much more. The focus of the show is to create connection and to be able to talk about issues that affect all of us and how to be able to be the healthiest versions of ourselves that we can be. Each show, I invite a guest co-host to join me and answer people's questions and share their experiences. Tonight, we have an international guest, as I am in New York, <laughs> over from the UK, is Karen Bashford. Welcome, Karen, to Friday Night Feels. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I, I, and so I just wanted to introduce a little Karen and also just appreciate because I know it's early in the morning there, so... Friday Night Feels is going international again, so I appreciate it. <laughs> the, and Karen <clears throat> is a mentor and energy healer, author, and speaker for abused and traumatized women who have experienced many challenges in their lives, including life-changing illnesses and diseases, broken family relationships, and financial instability. She enables women to rapidly become calmly confident, to be happier and healthier with purpose and direction. Karen can understand the impact of abusive relationship after experiencing to herself that left her financially broke and suffering from a life-threatening autoimmune disease. Despite, a chi despite having a chi happy childhood, um, Karen, sorry, that part. I cut off. Karen works to educate and empower women to manifest the life they love. It changes their lives and family, spreading out into the community and ultimately the world when they know and feel they are worthy of being seen and heard. So Karen, welcome. And I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. And so where would you like to begin? Because as we were getting ready to go live, I, I had asked you what you wanted to talk about. And for those of you, those of who are watching this know me, I, I'm a trauma therapist and I incorporate into uh, most of everything I do. And Karen's initial response was, we need to talk about trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so I, I love it. <laughs> It's something that needs to be spoken about more and more because people don't realize the impact of it, unfortunately. Right. And, and so how, I mean, and, and you also, you we were talking about, you talk about so many amazing areas such as trauma, manifestation, mind, body, soul connection, intuition, relationships, uh, and, and all these different issues. How, what is your journey that brought you into doing the work that you're doing? Okay. Um, well, I'm naturally psychic and have been since a baby. Um, okay. It runs through my family. Um, hence why I very much believe that you should tap into your own intuition and your body's natural ability to communicate. Um, because if I hadn't done so, I would have probably been either dead from bladder cancer or my autoimmune disease. Oh, wow. Because if I hadn't listened to what my body was communicating, I certainly wouldn't have known I'd had bladder cancer because the doctors kept dismissing me and saying, mm. no, no, you've got cystitis, you've got cystitis. <laughs> I had no infections, but I still had the chronic cystitis. Wow. And how and, long did you deal with that? Um, it went on probably for about four or five months before oh. I got to the point where I said, can we just investigate what's <laughs> going on? <laughs> just a little. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So, um, yeah, the result was I landed up in a hospital with an exploratory and they literally removed a pinhead of cancer. Wow. End of it. It was gone, finished with. And, and, and if we can just backtrack a little bit, what? how did you know something was wrong? Well, as I say, cystitis is the desire to go to the toilet all the time. You have a, a, a sensation of heavy pulling this sometimes in the bladder. Um, and it can be quite painful. Okay. And normally when you get cystitis, there is an infection with it. But every time the doctor did a test, there was no infection. So my body just kept getting worse and worse. My bladder kept giving me more and more problems. And it, it was a case of, well, we've got to deal with this or else what is it? I've right. got to know what it is. So, right. yeah. Right. Wow, that is amazing. And and then after they took out the cancer, what what happened then? Nothing. Oh, well, I mean, you went on, so I mean, <laughs> I'm still alive. No. <laughs> and you're um, helping people, so I feel like a lot happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, the cancer <laughs> itself was gone, um, but. It was like, that was the start of the warning sign to say to me, Karen, you need to deal with your life. Because I was in an abusive relationship. It was very um, emotionally abusive. My husband, unfortunately, didn't believe in working, expected everything. And if I didn't provide, there was always a problem. So he was he really was very good at manipulating and putting me down. Um, the bladder was a warning sign because if you think of what the bladder does, it pisses. Mm -hmm. And consequently, the bladder was trying to tell me I was pissed off with my <laughs> life. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. <laughs> so it's like a big warning sign. You need to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, I chose to ignore it. And consequently, I then, when I finally decided to get divorced from my um, wonderful emotional partner, um, I produced an autoimmune disease um and I say produced it because again my body was trying to tell me let's step away let's give ourselves a rest let's let go of all this stress worry and everything else and I landed up with an autoimmune disease that normally a four-year-old child would get I was oh. 40 <laughs> I did an autoimmune oh well, a little jump Four decades yeah. later. <laughs> wow. Um, but unfortunately, this autoimmune disease, as a child, you have a prognosis of getting to the age 10, and that's it then. Your body actually eats itself from the inside out. Right. And that's what my body was doing to itself. It was eating itself inside out because um, I produced too many white cells. It kept thinking it had bacteria. And really, if you look back over my life, you, I, you would understand, I did feel that I was dying inside. Mm. So um, yes, it makes total sense as to why I produced the disease that would eat me from inside down. Right. How long did it take for them to diagnose that? And, and they must, I mean, everyone just must have been surprised as they're saying, because it, it's usually in a child. It took them two years to actually diagnose it um, because it was so rare especially in the UK. Apparently there was more cases in America, okay. but in the UK, I think there was four of us. And I was really, really grateful that I'd managed to have the biopsy done and had the lab technician check it that had already seen it in another case. Wow. Otherwise I could have just been continuing trying to find out what it was right. and wouldn't have necessarily found out, yeah. And, and then how did that affect your life going forward? 
Um, unfortunately, I it's classed as a cancer, so they treat it with chemotherapy. And my whole attitude <coughs> to chemotherapy, if you don't need it, don't take it. Let's find something else before we get to that point. Right. And consequently, they decided they would start me on a course of antibiotics which should then trigger my body into thinking there's no bacteria so it would stop producing the white cells that was a brilliant idea except the doctor prescribed 800 milligrams a day instead of 200 huh. and consequently at the end of a week i was not the same person i was literally poisoned Oh, my goodness. And for five years, I had to watch what I ate and what I drank, because if I didn't, I could actually do myself quite a lot of harm because my body just reacted to it. I mean, it was and so I still, damaged. Yeah. And I still cannot take drugs nowadays. If you try and put drugs into me, my body just goes into overdrive again. And even oh. now I've done a lot of healing work on the actual tablet itself, so my body doesn't remember the tablet. Um, it still remembers the natural reaction to drugs. So it remembers I, the trauma. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Wow. And and then how how did that turn into you? I mean, with all of those different experiences, it, when did you start realizing, oh, this is trauma, or this is trauma, or that? Like, how did that come to to light for you? Um, I decided to make, um, I suppose it was a case of a big question of why do I bring these people into my lives, into my life that causes me pain, that causes me to suffer, that causes me to question who I am. And it was like, I need to do something about this. So consequently, I started my own personal development and in that was like realizing the body does communicate with you, mm -hmm. as I well know, mm -hmm. and exploring a way that I could benefit from A, that communication, but then also sharing it with my friends and family. But my actual trauma, funny enough, I did not learn about until I was 50. Um, and that was literally, again, my natural tendency to listen to the psychic and to my body. And I was being coached. And the woman that was coaching me said to me, what would you love most in your life? And then, uh, yeah, you'd expect question. the usual. You'd expect the usual. I would like this, <laughs> I'd like a successful business or maybe right. a loving relationship. Right. No, Karen props up and says, I'd love to hear my parents tell me they love me and actually hug me. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, where did this come from? <laughs> I love that. Wow. Yeah, wow. I hadn't realized that they'd never ever told me they loved me or hugged me. I had not realized. It was just so normal. There was never a question. Mm -hmm. So yes, that was my trauma. <laughs> And then the healing started from there. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's so interesting, you know, I think uh, when I'm talking to someone about trauma, um, you know, they have very distinguished definitions, you know, something, you know, 9-11 or um, someone from war or, you know, a, an assault or something. And when you look at trauma and the, the true definition is a wound, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, maybe, maybe I, I haven't seen myself, you know, I think people worry, well, I don't have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or I don't have this, or I just have a little anxiety or depression, or I'm just stressed. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. when you take the layers apart and you start mm -hmm. seeing, it's like, no, there's some wounds here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. And it was a huge wake up because I'd happily hugged my friends and family members that weren't part of my initial family. 
and no trouble at all. I'm happy to tell somebody I love them. I don't have an issue with it, but I'd never actually experienced it. Even in my husband and subsequent partner, they would hug me, but they never knew how to say, I love you. Were you, if your friends told you they loved you, were you able to accept that or was that foreign? No, I was able to accept it. (coughs) It was almost as if my body and mind knew this was part of life and could accept it, but never actually could associate as not having had it from my parents until I was 50. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, there's a, a book that we've referred to in the trauma community a lot called The, Tra- the Body Keeps the Score. Brilliant. And, and, right, okay, you right, I wasn't sure. And it just, it just talks about, for those who may not have read it, really about the body holds on to everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I just love exploring that because I think, especially what I've seen in my experiences, um, it, you know, if there's a medical problem, what I was raised with is like, so you go to the doctor, they do the test, they give you medicine, or they tell you what to do or not to do. And then that, and then the symptoms, the problem should go away. Mm-hmm. But as <laughs> I got older, I learned, oh, wait a minute, am I, is this, is there more to this? Mm-hmm. And Am I treating the symptoms or am I treating the cause? Am I treating the actual injury? You know, what What are we actually working with? And I don't know if you experience this, Karen, but um, a, a lot of people I know um, they get very anxious when they have to go to a doctor's appointment. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that, that I've had conversations with is that on top of the anxiety, it's also very stressful because it's usually very fast. Yeah. Have you you experienced that at all or or see that of? um, Well, I do know. um, Having experienced the impact of seeing a doctor and the consequences of it. For me, doctors are probably the most scariest people going, despite the fact I know they can help me. (laughs) Um, So to go to a doctor is usually a no. I tend to go for alternatives now because I know how my body reacts to drugs. So I tend to go seek homeopathic remedies or reflexology, anything like that, that rebalances my body. So, but having said that, I've also had um, pancreatitis twice. So I've had to land up in the hospital. Right. So um, doctors do amazing things never ever put them down because they do do amazing things but they don't work with the whole body they work on the symptoms right and I think they miss something for doing that because they can fill you with drugs they can do operations but they don't get to the root cause of why your body is created and it does create it as a warning right yes yes any illness you get any heart problems heart is to do with not being loved and looking for love liver and gallbladder are to do with anger and how many traumatized people are angry right right yes Yes. And how many traumatized people who are angry, but don't want to acknowledge the anger? No, but the body does. (laughs) Oh, yes. Yes. A lot of the conversations I have with people are also are along the same lines of so you have there's depression, there's there's anxiety. And I love to ask, how do you handle anger? Because it's what I've seen in the mental health field is that's not a common question. Mm-mm-mm. It's only asked if someone needs anger management because they're the problem ones. Yes. <clears throat> and and I remember with different people over the course of of my experiences of saying, oh oh no, I could 
I can see the anger. <laughs> like I can feel it. It's like, you know, either with me or with a story, you can just, the energy of the room just changes. Yeah. And then having that conversation of, of normalizing, let, you can't really heal until you recognize that you're anger, angry. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, <clears throat> as I say, I go for alternative medicines now and holistic treatments and such. And um, one gentleman I went to see fairly soon after my father had died um, and bless him. He's, he was, it was more like a spiritual healing in the sense of it was um, digging deep into what I felt was needed for me to understand why I was so angry at my father mm. when he died. And he tapped into um, my gallbladder and liver and said, actually, there's a whacking great volcano. And it, it, he described a powerful it. powerful description. As he was describing it, I was sitting thinking, actually, that's very apt because that's how I felt around my father dying because... Mm. We'd never had a real chance to um, get to know each other because he was quite a closed off person. (laughs) But he was also a person that pushed me to achieve what I wanted to achieve. (laughs) But we never had that really close bond. (laughs) And it was like, you died before... I got this opportunity, Mm -hmm. but I hadn't realized it was also going back to my original trauma where he hadn't been able to show me or hold me as a baby and give me a hug anyway or say, I love you. And that anger was so focused in on that unawareness of that was what I was feeling because I still did not know at that point when he died why I had the trauma in the first place because my life as a child was normal right great so yeah but I had a volcano of anger (laughs) so (laughs) what did you do with this volcano (laughs) like (laughs) I mean that's a powerful revelation to make well (sighs) I think with the awareness it was there, it was like questioning, why am I angry? And yes, I was angry because he died earlier than he needed to. He was a smoker and had been all his life, having been in the Navy with all the stress of being in the Navy, just um, it took its toll on him and he smoked to sort of keep his calm Mm. because I should imagine inside of him was another volcano. <laughs> right, right. Um, so it was with the awareness, it was like, why am I so angry? And then when I started to explore my, my relationship with my husband, at which point I divorced him, it was like, oh, well, that explains why I feel like this, because this, and it was all those situations that, had made me angry, but I wasn't allowed to express that anger. Mm-hmm. And it had all sort of been storing up and this working great volcano was right. <laughs> right. Wow. And, and then how did your healing go from there? It was like there's a floodgate of awareness that opened and it was like, right, we can deal with the anger what else what else what else and it was I was actually learning emotions I didn't know I had Mm. you people would say to me you're very um you express your emotions through your face you know I I do pull faces and all the rest of it and it's like oh really okay but I didn't know what those emotions were I couldn't (laughs) tell you what they were Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a case of suddenly this floodgate of this is this feeling and this creates this emotion. And it's like, oh, really? Who am I? 
right, right. And then the question that I hear a lot is, what do I do with these emotions? Yeah, 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 I had no idea. I'd never been conscious of excitement. I didn't know what excitement was. Right. I didn't know, I, I would never ever cry. Never ever cry. And it was like suddenly the floodgates open and I'd suddenly start crying. And I'd be sitting there thinking, why am I crying? What's this? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, and and it feels almost foreign, but also like this missing piece that's been waiting to be to be nurtured and taken in and and honored because it has a story that that energy i i believe very much so um i tend to work with the inner child because i think oh especially for me not being loved or told i was loved as a child there was this desperate need to be feeling that i was lovable and that i deserved to be loved and to suddenly have these emotions coming up, it was like, so what do I need as a person? But going back to that child. Oh, right. What because, a great question. What do I need? Yeah, because as a child, we are naturally born with the ability to give love and be loved. Mm -hmm. But as we experience this, our, our trauma as children, that natural expression of love can be very much, as you're aware of as a trauma specialist, suppressed. Correct. Yes. And it's like, you, oh, there's love here. What do I do with this? Oh, right. let's just make sure my little girl is loved first, should we? <laughs> and it's it's interesting because when you talk about that, sometimes people have such an aversion to oh this little you're in a little you or inner you or your inner child or but it makes such sense <laughs> that they're you know because trauma is is timeless like it's stuck it doesn't work like linear like seven eight or nine o'clock and so of course there's that part i look at it um i read this book um once and they explained it in such a beautiful way that we think we have this one personality and it's just like just Patrick but we really are much more like a diamond with different facets mm -hmm. and I could just visualize that and say oh yeah you know you have your your playful one your professional one your 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 tax person you know whatever it might be like all these different you know the child the partner the the mm -hmm. and all these different pieces and then when the communication between the different parts is broken, that's when we start seeing problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways I work with my clients is, is to actually have them bring all the parts. And when I say parts, I mean every second of their life into a stadium and actually have a communication with them because at some point, someone will turn around and say to them, well, actually, you were doing brilliantly. You just didn't know who you were because nobody had told you. Mm -hmm. And it's such an eye opener for them to actually hear themselves say it to themselves. Right, right. And it is so, so amazingly effective. It's like, oh, actually, I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, and I'm, I was wondering when you were saying this too, when you were in the the abusive relationship, so many people when they're trying to get out of it or they're trying to realize there's that guilt and that shame and the, how did I let this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I think that gets people stuck. And I remember someone, um, a colleague of mine was telling me, we were having a discussion like this. And she said, we have to remember that the abusers are adept at what they're doing. Oh, terribly. And it doesn't matter how professional, how intelligent, how whatever you think your skills or gifts are, they know how to counteract your strengths and to actually use your strengths against you to sort of imprison you in the relationship. 
Mm -hmm. And so I, I would imagine doing the work that you do with traumatized women must be very freeing when they're able to say, oh, this wasn't me. This wasn't, I, this wasn't my fault. I have been blessed to be working with a lady um, who basically suffered trauma in the womb initially because she knew even in the womb she wasn't wanted. Oh, wow. And her whole life has been one of trying to satisfy her parents to the point where she sacrificed who she is totally and we've been doing a lot of work and what Tuesday for the first time ever on Tuesday she could actually say I feel loved and cherished oh my gosh because in the womb she knew she was not wanted right the pregnancy unfortunately Whilst the couple were married, neither of them wanted children. Mm. And from what I understand, the mother did try to abort, but it didn't work. So she knows that A, she wasn't wanted, B, that the mother had tried to abort her. And then consequently, she didn't, she was always in the wrong mm. because she wasn't wanted. <laughs> And, and also, how do we put it, um, was always feeling that she had to prove herself. Right. So she's carried that the whole of her life. And even though she's married and got a child herself, she's never felt loved inside. She mm -hmm. never felt her little girl was loved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, a, it was phenomenal to hear her say, I feel loved and cherished. Wow, that is beautiful. Isn't it, Josh? Yeah, that's lovely. And, and just to think, you know, have we ever said that to ourselves? Something mm -hmm. like, I feel loved or I feel, you mm -hmm. know, valued or cherished or worthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and even to see, oh, <laughs> does that bring something up for us? It's, and then, oh, yeah. and then we go in. <laughs> yes, isn't it? Then the yeah. work begins. Yes. I can remember sitting in a hairdresser's um, chair looking at the mirror and I sat there one day, my, my friend was actually doing my hair and I just said, do you know what, I actually love me and oh my god, it was just, wow, I can actually say that to myself now and all these years <laughs> I've never been aware I wasn't loved and like it was this in discovering what I discovered about my parents and I don't blame them I seriously don't blame them and I I appreciate parents have grown up in that age where there was no time to really express love it wasn't something that was done so I don't blame them at all right. But it was like this light bulb moment of actually I can look at myself and I can actually say I love myself. And it was like, oh, I can breathe. Mm. Yes, I'm free. Yeah. Because once you love yourself, then the miracles really start to unfold. Yes, definitely. Most definitely. It was just absolutely wonderful to... All the work I'd done had finally got me to that point where I could look at myself and think, actually, I do love me. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's not... it's profound because when you look back at it, it might be, you know, oh, that's such a simple thing to say. But man, when you have all the walls and all the barriers and then life and traumas on top of that, it's, and then usually we judge it because it's, because it's, uh, you know, we go into the, oh, that's logical or illogical or, you know, don't be, you know, all those other judgments. And and sometimes when we silence all those noises, that's when we can really hear, no, this is this is where the injury is. Hmm. So, yeah, it was 
beautiful feeling and it still is to know that I I love myself (laughs) I wish more people could actually say that they love themselves because it does open you up to a totally different world right right You, you don't judge yourself you accept that you do make mistakes you accept that well it's like my book how to be imperfectly perfect you can be imperfect but still be perfect (laughs) <laughs> why not I, yeah it's so funny when someone says oh it wasn't perfect like if I did something I'm like I, I, and I stopped them. I'm like you know that's not actually possible right <laughs> like there is no perfection and they're like I know I know I know but I still wanted it to be perfect it's like okay well <laughs> yeah but yeah because it, 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 you're born perfect you have the ability to be the best you can be from the moment you're conceived. And yet we experience all these traumas without even knowing about them necessarily. Right. And then we, we perceive ourselves to be imperfect. Well, actually, just accept you are imperfect. <laughs> it's so much easier. <laughs> yes. And it's like, oh. Okay, now I can live life. Now, now I can enjoy the the ice cream sundae and not judge myself <laughs> and celebrate life. Right? You know, we're so hard. I find we're so hard on ourselves that not only self love is difficult, but I think forgiveness is another is another component. And it's interesting, you know, is is one of the topics that you talk about with with manifesting. And, you know, if we could just kind of jump into that in a minute, because, you know, as we're talking about intuition and and different ways of connecting to ourselves and who we are and loving ourselves, it's it really opens the door to like, what are our beliefs about ourselves and then energy and what's out there, what we're capable of and also what we're worthy of. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes the the most profound questions can appear the most simplistic, like, you know, do you love yourself? What, and I think one of the questions you had said, someone asked or your coach said, is like, what do you want in your life? And how, when you look at it in a different way, it can really show us, oh, I see what I want, but I'm also learning where my blockages are. Yeah. Hmm. Manifestation, most people assume it's the thought you create is your reality. The thing about manifestation is, yes, the thought is partially responsible. What you think is what you can create. But they don't remember that if their thoughts are negative, that they're criticizing themselves or they're saying, I don't want, rather than I want, they're still going to manifest because that's how it works. Thoughts create reality. And could you explain a little bit more of that? Because I I just, I love this discussion because I, I just hear the, skeptic saying oh does that mean if i say i want a million dollars i'm going to get a million dollars and no because at the end of the day you <laughs> have to believe you're capable of having that million dollars for a and that you're worthy of it right yeah <laughs> but it's then it's easy to say oh well karen just wants me to wave some magic words and of course it's not gonna so then everything is discounted Instead of saying, oh, let's let's explore this like an onion. Let's pull this apart and really yeah. see yeah. what does that creation mean for you? Well, it's like when I once was told that um, to manifest, you have to want it. But you have to feel that want. But you have to imagine what it's going to be like having it. But... The trouble with manifestation is you might want to f- imagine it. If there's a part in your body that's going, don't be stupid, you, you, no way, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get it. Mm-hmm. You've got to work on what you believe about yourself and what you deserve before you're ever going to manifest something that's 
not been in your life. Mm -hmm. If you want even $5,000 in your bank account, if there's a part of you that's going, oh, don't be stupid, you've never had it, where the hell are you going to get $5,000 mm -hmm. from? You're going to stop yourself from finding that $5,000. Right, right. Because and so <laughs> what, how do you suggest people when they when they identify so let's say they're trying to to work on their manifesting and they they identify that piece of oh dummy you know you will never get this what do you do with that part that doubting thomas you deal with it you speak to it you acknowledge it and you ask questions why are you here what do i need to know about you that's telling me that i've got to do something to be able to allow myself to receive. I knew for a very long time that I could manifest debt, but I couldn't manifest abundance. Mm -hmm. And it was like, so why do I keep creating debt? Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that said, I didn't deserve money. If you don't deserve money, how the hell are you ever going to produce money? Right, right. So it, it's asking the questions and where do these stories come from? Mm -hmm. That's a really I good know question. I, my parents were always reasonably, well, they always had enough money but that was the problem. They had enough money. <laughs> and I was carrying, it's okay to have enough. It wasn't okay <laughs> to have more than enough. Right. In your actual outcomes, there is knowledge to be had. There is an awareness to be had. So it, in manifesting debt, I wanted a lifestyle that my brain was telling me I wanted, but my body emotionally was saying, or vibrationally was saying, that's not possible. Mm. Look at where you're coming from. Why do you deserve more? What is it that mm -hmm. entitles you to more? Right. Well, then you start looking at, well, what do I believe about myself in my right to have more money? Because Everyone can have more money, right. although we have to remember that money is just an energy that enables us to enjoy life more. Mm -hmm. It's not the be all and end all. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe what is manifestation of abundance? What's that? Is that love? Is that better relationships? Is that ability to be able to help other people? There's more to just life than money. Mm -hmm. And yet we focus on money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So money it, has a lot of power in, in our belief systems. I, I see that. System. Yeah, definitely. Time. Definitely. We're all told to, oh, you've got to do well. You've got to have more money. You've got to have this bigger house. You've got to have this bigger car. Actually, step back. What makes you happy? Right. 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 Does that bigger house make you happy? <laughs> or does it just give you more debt? And does it right. give you more stress and worry? Because... Especially nowadays, you've got to heat it. Right, right. And things like that. So what makes you happy is right. the biggest question you need to ask yourself when it comes to manifesting. That's a really good point. And, and it's funny because as you're saying that, it, it reminds me of a story, especially um, it, the first year of COVID, let's say. One of the things that I found is I, I like chocolates. <laughs> so I had found I had found this really, really neat chocolate company and you know good chocolate is more expensive and so I had posted a picture of that on my on my personal social media and I remember and it was it was fun it was with so much heaviness I was like here is something light and fun and it's really cool and I remember a friend of mine uh had said well it's like oh that must be nice to be able to afford something like that and I remember to me, it hit my shame button, like, oh my gosh, did I do something wrong? Am I being privileged? You know, it, it 
this cascade of negative beliefs. Mm-hmm. And luckily I was able to work through that because I still buy chocolate. <laughs> but, <You do. laughs> but it was interesting. It was almost just like this, what would be a good word? Interference. Mm. And, but it did show me where my wounds were because that the, mm-hmm. the person, I knew they were projecting. Mm-hmm. But if I hadn't had enough insight to say, okay, so now I have to do the work and say, I get to enjoy these chocolates because I work hard. And I may not have other things that other people have, but I'm going to enjoy this box of chocolates. Well, this is it, isn't it? People forget that we are not the same person as they are. So we have different upbringings. We have different tastes. We have different desires. So just because you like quality chocolate, um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Somebody else might not like the chocolate, but would prefer to go and buy a good bottle of wine. Right. But does that mean we have to judge them because they're buying a good quality wine rather than a good quality chocolate? Right, right. We have to remember that we are not each other. We are connected simply because of who we are as human beings, Mm -hmm. but we're not the same. There's different stories in the background. And if you don't have a lot of money, what's wrong with having a bit of luxury in your life of having a nice bar of chocolate or a box of chocolates? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with having that bit of extra luxury with utilizing the money you have or that bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. It's about what makes you happy and appreciating what makes you happy. Mm-hmm. And I think also, too, what you're saying is it's not like a wish list to Santa Claus. Like, oh, I just want it. It's like there is a belief system which ties into everything that we're talking about with with trauma, with anxiety, with with an intuition and, and listening to who we are and how we see how our see we see ourselves in the world and what we feel that we deserve in a in a loving balanced humil- human what's the word mm. humility mm. and balance i find yes totally and so when when you have someone you know coming in to work with you what does that look like like in your in the work that you offer um i seem to attract people that have tried a lot of other therapies um alternative not alternative natural processes the usual channel like um, psychiatrist and counseling and such like but there's a sense inside that they aren't whole and complete Mm. because the way I work is I come more from the spiritual rather than the sort of talking and sort of logical side of it. Although I am very practical, um, right. I'm not woo-woo in the sense of, oh, we're <laughs> going to do a lot of meditation. No, 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 no. I can't sit and meditate for the life <laughs> of me. <laughs> so I'm certainly not going to say to somebody, sit and meditate. In no. silence, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. Um, but I'd work at such a deep level with the soul um and i do say your inner child is your soul and your soul has been on your journey and they have an answer the soul has all the answers you need to be able to find that missing piece of you that you sense is missing but can't find it um which is one of the reasons I've been working with a lady that sort of, you know, was traumatized in the womb because she said there was something missing, but I've tried so many different ways of finding that missing part of me. I've not been able to. Mm -hmm. And because I do work at such a deep level, the changes are profound very rapidly. So I will do a 90 minutes session with somebody having had say a 30 minute conversation with them I don't take them back into their trauma 
I'm not interested in going into their trauma. In fact, the 30 minutes I generally have with them is just a basic outline of their life. Okay. And um, from there, I can pinpoint what needs to be approached. But the great thing about it is once they start working with their soul when they're, with their inner child, they get all the answers coming in. They can tell me what's the next step. Mm -hmm. Or they can say, oh, I would say to them, how are you doing? What's going on? And it's like, oh, I've done this, this and this. Okay, great. Because <laughs> they get the guidance that they need to find the answers that they need within them. Right. Um, it's without having a, a proper conversation around this, it's <laughs> hard to explain because it's, it's, I would take an example of saying somebody who's been traumatized in the womb, I would definitely do into the womb take them back into the womb and imagine themselves. It's a bit like birthing themselves again, okay. but coming out as a different person or finding that love within themselves, but also the surrounding, not necessarily from their parents, but from the surrounding people, from grandparents or something like that, because there's always going to be someone in their life that has shown them that love. Right, right. So change the story from the womb and in doing so, you create a totally different story in right. your life because you release the energy attached to that wound of the trauma. So. Right. Yes. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and how has very effective. how has life changed since COVID happened and, and doing your work? Well, my work um, with my clients, I won't do anything face to face with them. Okay. Everything has to be over Zoom. Okay. Um, it's just as effective over Zoom as face to face. But um, I, I say to my clients, when you work with me, it's like having major surgery without having the knives. Oh, I love that. <clears throat> I might have to borrow that. <laughs> yeah. It is so mm. deep that it feels as though something has been removed from them. And it's like, I just need to rest now. I yes. need to just allow my body to rest. And, and I think, and I don't know what your experiences are, Karen, but sometimes even having the conversations of who would I be without this pain or without this volcano of anger or any of this, sometimes it is really unsettling for people because it's mm -hmm. been part of who they are for so long. Well, yeah, it's, it's understanding that who am I now if I don't have this anger or <laughs> if I don't have this wound that's been festering away at me who am I right and yeah it's it is major it is major and, and one of the things that I've learned too is is to be able to just slow and steady and say well I'm not trying to take anything away I'm trying to give you more so that because the trauma you know takes away choices mm -hmm. and when you're doing the work whatever whatever component it is of healing it's about giving that part of yourself more options that they may never have had hmm. yeah is what i find yeah i totally agree and i also have a tendency when we remove something we always replace it with something better right. so it's allowing them to see that they can let go but in letting go, they can bring something better in. Mm -hmm. And that, that's so, so important with any of my work is actually them understanding that it's not going to be a void. There is something there right. to replace. Right. So if, if people wanted to connect with you or learn more about the work you do, how is the best way to connect with you? Well, they can certainly do it through Facebook, um, Karen A. Bashford. They can do it through LinkedIn as Karen Bashford. They can certainly go to my website. It's um, themanifestinglady.com. Um, and there's a form that offers a three 30-minute conversation with me um, to understand what's going on in their lives, why they might be having the struggles they are having worked with other people and still not got the answers, okay. there's that opportunity. 
Awesome. Wonderful. And I'll, you know, if anyone ever wants to connect with you, just reach out to me and I'll definitely help you connect if they're interested in that. So I have to ask, um, I love the name, the manifesting lady. How did you come up with that? Um, I didn't come up with it. It oh. was interesting. Um, my background is finance. I've worked for a bank. I've been a financial advisor. And I, I coach on money mindset when I work with people anyway. <laughs> And I used to do a lot of networking and I got to know a lot of people and I was the person that quite often would have that conversation. It would be, I'm not doing so well in the business. This isn't happening and this isn't happening. So I would just sit there and say, well, why are you blocking yourself for doing, not sending those emails out to say to somebody, hey, you know, I'm still here. Would you like another session or would you like to purchase some more body cream or whatever mm -hmm. they were selling? And it was like, just do it. And it was like, just having those conversations, people would say, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, well. But, yeah, stop butting and just do it kind of thing I'm that a very awesome. straightforward person yes. so if you turn around and say but to me it's like why but what excuses have you got to but <laughs> I love <laughs> and they'd, That's so funny. Go, they'd go they'd come back if maybe a month or two later <laughs> from networking and they'd come up and say it worked <laughs> yeah. and you know what an amazing loving gift of just that gentle push, because even though it sounds like, well, you know, rumble, grumble, you know, she's pushing me on it, but it's saying, I'm challenging you because I believe in you. Yeah. And you yeah. just don't see it, but I do. Yeah. And that's how the title come out, because I literally was that person. They would come back and say, it worked. <laughs> and after a while, I started getting the title, The Manifesting Lady. Because oh, I love it. it. Very sweet to Karen. She'd be able to help me. <laughs> oh, it's like a good luck charm. <laughs> it just, that's a great reputation to have. <laughs> I love that. So as we, as we wind down tonight, Karen, I, I always love to ask my guests, you know, what is one thing or one piece of advice that you would like the audience to walk away with? Something that is meaningful for you forget everything anyone's ever told you about yourself mm. you are perfect as you are so stop worrying about what people think of you what they say about you and just believe you are good enough. I love that. You are good enough. That's a beautiful message. One I hope I think we all can remember and need to every once in a while. So I appreciate that, Karen. And, and thank you so much for, I know it's early in the morning there. So I appreciate you joining on Friday. It's definitely been a lovely conversation. I hope you can come back sometime part of the Friday Night Feels family. And and um, it's just been lovely getting to know you and hear your story. I really well, appreciate it. It's been great being here. It's been <laughs> real fun. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, it's been awesome. I love it. Magical, <laughs> like, definitely. Um, so I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. And thank you for all of the support of Friday Night Feels. And just remember, we are on all the different platforms now for the podcast, YouTube. So just, you know, like and support. And I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.